my travels and journeying around this beautiful earth, few places have left as strong an impression on me as my time in India. India has often been referred to as a country of contrast. It is a country rich with deep history, with colors, with extraordinary fruits and other food, rich with life lived. I experienced some of the brightest smiles, the most gorgeous of clothing in their saris and scarves, the most intoxicatingly stunning agriculture that I believe the world has to offer. But it is also a place that has had a turbulent political history. And though things have improved since I visited there, vast wealth and equality. The poverty I witnessed was pervasive and mind-blowing. Beggars everywhere in the city, in the country, everywhere. The smell of human body odor, the deplorable physical ailments, the pushing and shoving and begging and yelling. In my 19-year-old mind's eye, it was all everywhere. Everywhere, that is, until I walked into our grand, gated, larger-than-life hotel. Vaulted ceilings, luxury cafes and boutiques inside. The place could have been the size of an airport. Rooms so luxurious I didn't dare breathe. The contrast from the noisy, overcrowded streets and the quiet, lush, extravagant hotel was very, very stark, dizzying and overwhelming. Our group complained that we could have, indeed should have, stayed in less affluent quarters. But one wise, well-traveled person among us remarked, here in India, it's either the plaza or the shacks, a nation of contrasts. Every time we left the hotel to engage in actual work or in visits with locals, it felt like we were dancing between two worlds, the world of sheer abundance and the world of nothing. Today's passage could very well be described as a story of contrast, of a man who has it all, contrasted with a man who has absolutely nothing. We are told that a man named Lazarus lives at the gate of a rich man who remains unnamed in our story. The distance between them is both enormous and small. They are close to one another in proximity, but in reality could not live any further apart. As an interesting aside, for the next time you play Bible trivia or something, this Lazarus is the only character in all of Jesus' parables who is given a name. The name Lazarus literally means whom God helps, which is a fitting description for both what happens next and for what does not happen. The rich man is finely clothed in clothes reserved for the royalty of Jesus' day, and his eating habits reflect this lavish living as well. Lazarus, by contrast, is clothed in open sores and has no food. Almost like the start of a bad joke, they both die. And we are told that the rich man goes down into Hades and Lazarus is with Abraham. Being in the bosom of Abraham was considered to be the most blissful resting place one could attain, reserved for the martyrs of the faith. So Lazarus is being elevated to the most honorable position possible. But about the rich man? The story goes that he is in Hades. Now, a word of caution. It's very easy to impose a sort of heaven-hell dichotomy onto this passage. Certainly our 21st century ears might hear it this way. But that was not the first century understanding of an afterlife. In Jesus' day, Hades was considered simply a place of the dead, where they awaited judgment, and was sometimes thought of as having different rooms according to people's morals. So scholars have debated about whether both Lazarus and the rich man are in Hades, or whether Lazarus has risen elsewhere. But, the, but really, the point here is that while there is a divide between the two men, they can also see one another and interact, just as they did in life. Very interesting. The rich man chooses to interact by saying this, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. Did you catch that? For starters, the rich man doesn't speak to Lazarus directly, but instead asks Abraham to send him over. Just as in life, here too in death, he acts as though Lazarus is someone who can be talked about 
rather than two. Not a human, not someone worthy of being addressed directly. Secondly, he is asking Lazarus to serve him once again, this time to leave his comfortable dwelling with Abraham in order to enter the flames instead. This is what Abraham objects to, as he reminds the rich man that Lazarus is done with serving and now has received his due reward of comfort. But here's the kicker for me. The rich man asks for Lazarus by name as in he knows him, as in he likely knew his name when he was a penniless beggar living outside the rich man's gated community. Friends, this is not a story about the nameless poor halfway around the world or about sending our money and aid to country X. This is about the poor right outside our gates. This is about the people whose names we know people who are already in our lives who could use some help. Note here, too, that the rich man is not disdainful or abusive towards Lazarus. He's not a cruel man, at least not outwardly. He just ignores him, both in this life and the one after. I'm sure most of us don't try to do this, but there can be a tendency to turn a blind eye towards those close to us who need something from us. It's the classic story, the doctor mom, who gives all she can for her patients, but doesn't leave enough in the tank to devote time to her own kids when she gets home. Or the minister who serves the homeless all day, but who doesn't invest in the relationship with their spouse. And, like it or not, scripture tells us that this has consequences, and eternal consequences at that. Abraham explains, Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. This can sound like judgmental condemnation, but I don't believe it is intended to be that for one very distinct reason. In addressing the rich man, Abraham uses the word technon, Technon is the Greek word for child. It is an intimate word, a word that connotes strong connections and relationships. Abraham addresses the rich man with technon. Friends, we are all children in the eyes of God. We are all intimately loved. The chasm that this parable references, might it be a chasm of the heart? Might it be a man-made chasm, a chasm that neither Abraham nor Lazarus can cross because it has been years in the making, dug little by little, shovel full at a time, every time the rich ruler chose to look away from others in need. This is Jacob Marley in A Christmas Carol, who bore the chains he forged in life. Might the distance between Lazarus and the rich man be actually of the rich man's choosing? Put another way, do we actually create our own Hades our own place where we are separated from dwelling in the arms of God. For by separating himself from Lazarus, his fellow brother in Christ, so too did the rich man separate himself from God. We could get into a fascinating discussion about our various theologies on hell. The scriptures actually have precious little to say about the afterlife. They remain far more concerned about this life, which is why Despite some creative rapping, I think this story has a lot more to say about how we lives, live our lives now, today, rather than being an accurate representation of the afterlife. In terms of our life here and now, this passage drives home why connection to one another is so hugely important. Every week we gather here, we are remembering who brings us to this place. We are remembering that we are called to see the Christ in one another. Whoever does this for the least of these does it for me, says Jesus. So, by the same token, distance from a community can often lead to distance from God. This is the chasm we make when we ignore the needs in one another. By not caring for each other, we run the risk of not caring for Christ. And that has consequences in how we see the world and in our relationship with God. 
The rich man ends his pleas by asking Abraham to then send Lazarus to his brothers who are still alive so that they may be warned. True to form, Abraham refuses, saying that those who are still alive, and this includes us, have already been given the guidance we need. If we don't heed that call, we're hardly going to be persuaded by anything else, not even a visit from another world. On this passage, Presbyterian minister Helen Montgomery de Beauvoir writes, the end of this parable pushes us back across the chasm into the earthly world. Break through, shouts the man. But in fact, God has already broken through with God's word through the prophets and in Christ. People have been given what they need to live faithful lives. They will listen or they will not. They will respond or they will not. I remain of the opinion that eternal life is not something that happens to us when we die. We are resurrected people now, thanks to Jesus Christ. Jesus has already brought eternal life to us, and we are called to live into that reality. Friends, we have been given all we need. God in Jesus has broken through the chasm. He has conquered death. Life has won. Love has won. The only chasms that remain are those of our own creation. When we choose to live into the contrast of our world, we, when we choose to separate ourselves from God and from another. One final story for all of us to ponder this morning. This anonymous parable may be familiar to some of you, but it is well worth revisiting. One day, a man said to God, God, I would like to know what heaven and hell are like. God showed the man two doors. Inside the first one, in the middle of the room, was a large round table with a large pot of stew. It smelled delicious and made the man's mouth water. But the people sitting around the table were thin and sickly. They appeared to be famished. They were holding spoons with very long handles and each found it possible to reach into the pot of stew and take a spoonful. But because the handle was longer than their arms, they could not get the spoons back into their mouths. The man shuddered at the sight of their misery and suffering. God said, you have seen hell. Behind the second door, the room appeared exactly the same. There was the large round table with the large pot of wonderful stew that made the man's mouth water. The people had the same long-handled spoons, but they were well-nourished and plump, laughing and talking. The man said, I don't understand. God smiled. It is simple, God said. Love only requires one skill. These people learned early on to share and feed one another, while the greedy think only of themselves. So, how are we doing at this? How is Woodmont United Church of Christ doing at feeding one another, at making the contrasts in our lives less stark? How are we doing at knowing the people in need in our lives and at our doorstep and in responding to that need with actual help and compassion? Are we working towards eradicating the chasms in our lives? Are we living as resurrected people? If we are not, be aware, says Jesus, that there are consequences not punishment, but simply consequences. For as we turn our hearts towards one another, they will become softened, shaped into more holy vessels. And as we give of ourselves in this way, the economy of God will become ever clearer. It is simple, God says. Love only requires one skill. Feed one another. May it be so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.